Hello, my name is Evan Haefeli, and in this lecture I'm going to be talking about the Great Awakening in colonial America. The Great Awakening was a major religious revival that took place around 1740 and lasted about five or six years. Historians have made lots of claims about the Great Awakening. That's the beginning of a distinct American identity, that's the beginning of de democratic ideals of choice, um, <clears throat> that it ultimately um, led to the American Revolution, that it's the origins of modern American evangelicalism. In my opinion, most of these claims don't really hold up. First of all, this was not something new or distinctively American. Although the scale of this awakening was much bigger, there had been revivals before in both Britain and America. Secondly, the Great Awakening did not include all of America. It took place almost exclusively in the North. Third, it didn't unite Americans, it divided them. Fourth, the American Revolution didn't happen until 30 years after the Great Awakening ended, a whole generation later. Finally, nobody at the time thought that what was happening was the first Great American, uh, first American Great Awakening. That's a term that Americans assigned to it in the 19th century when they were experiencing another Great Awakening. To really understand this Great Awakening, we have to remember that America was at the time part of Britain and its empire. If only because it's impossible to tell the story of the Great Awakening without reference to the British, especially the most famous preacher of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield. Before getting to the Awakening itself, some background inf information will help understand what was going on. The Great Awakening was a major religious revival, but it was not just about religion. It was also related to the history of immigration, of education, media, imperial warfare, and the new colony of Georgia, the last of the 13 colonies that, was ultimately <clears throat> that would ultimately declare independence from Britain in 1776. To start with the issue of religion, you should know about the concept of enthusiasm, which played a very important role in the Great Awakening. Nowadays, enthusiasm has po very positive connotations. We think it's good to be enthusiastic at something, to have a passionate interest in what you're doing and a strong emotional engagement with it. But back then, enthusiasm was not a good thing. It was a criticism of the sort of religious behavior associated with evangelical religion, especially its intense emotionalism, and the prominent role it gave to women in religious gatherings, as you can see in this image. The term enthusiasm began to be used after the English Revolution of the 17th century to criticize the Puritan revolutionaries, saying they got so carried away with their irrational religion that they rejected all sense of decency and order and threw the kingdom into a civil war that ended up killing the king and abolishing the monarchy and causing all kinds of chaos. So enthusiasm was not just a criticism of a style of religiosity, although it was that. It was also about religious and political and social authority. Anglicans, members of the Church of England, the official established church in England and in the southern colonies, took a conservative stance on religious and political authority because their church was part of the establishment part of the monarchy. The monarch was the head of their church. And it was a very hierarchically organized church with authority descending down from the monarch to bishops and then to the priests and then to the people, ideally starting with a male patriarch and then going to the women in the family and finally the children and servants and in the colonies to slaves as well. It was also a very regulated form of worship. Anglicans used the Book of Common Prayer, which contained prayers and sermons to be used in worship services. Anglican priests were supposed to follow the prayer book and do what it told them to do when conducting their services. They were not supposed to improvise and use lots of spontaneous prayers, nor were they supposed to write and preach long sermons of their own. Um, <clears throat> they could come up with their own sermons and prayers, but generally they took their prayers from the prayer book and kept their sermons short because the prayers and sermons were not the most important part of the worship service. It was the whole service and all of its rituals and ceremony that mattered. Puritans had rebelled against the style of religion in the 17th century, thinking it was too formal, too repetitive, boring, shallow. Some called it dead religion. 
For them, spontaneous prayers were the best kinds of prayers. It was more spiritually powerful to make up your own prayers to fit your immediate circumstances than rely on something someone had written long ago. Likewise, they believed that the sermons were the most important part of the religious service. This is where the real power of the Christian message came through, not in the ceremonies and rituals favored by Anglicans or Roman Catholics. To make good prayers and preach a good sermon, you had to stop using the Book of Common Prayer and read the Bible for yourself. Here's where the problem of religious authority came in. For Anglicans, like for Roman Catholics, religious authority was in the church hierarchy. It came down from the head of the church, be it the monarch in the case of Anglicans or the pope in the case of Catholics. Those lower down were supposed to follow their lead. For Puritans and the various other dissenting Protestants, the Bible was the primary source of authority. Some radicals even claimed that any literate person with access to the Bible could preach, not just educated ministers. A few went even further and believed that they didn't even really need the Bible. They could have a direct spiritual connection to God. These claims and the way people who supported them expressed their religiosity through emotional actions like crying and shouting, shaking their bodies, falling on the ground, moaning, sobbing, and so forth, all of that is what Anglicans meant by enthusiasm. During the Great Awakening, people who practiced that style of religion were known as New Lights. Their anti-enthusiasm opponents were known as Old Lights. They were also very religious, but they believe the New Lights practice a disorderly, disobedient, and potentially dangerous sort of religion that might get out of hand and threaten social and religious stability because it let common people take control of their own religion and express themselves in very dramatic ways instead of just sitting and listening dutifully as their ideal of religious practice was. The Enlightenment also figured into this because the Enlightenment stressed the, stressed the importance of reason over emotion and of self-control and moderation. Enthusiasm was both unreasonable, because it let the emotions take over, and it lacked self-control or moderation. Now, some evangelicals like Jonathan Edwards would use Enlightenment ideas and learning to develop their own ideas about how the emotions were actually an important part of an individual's religious experience, but in general, the Enlightenment was on the side of the Anglicans and the Old Lights. Another important factor in understanding the Great Awakening is the dramatic expansion of the Anglican Church in the first half of the 18th century. It was the most powerful <clears throat> and fastest growing church in the colonies. And in fact, just before the Great Awakening broke out, it looked like enlightened Anglicanism was going to be the religion of the future. Anglican Church was established in all of the southern colonies, and it was growing in the northern colonies too, with congregations in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and even New England. Um, <clears throat> Anglicans even had their own college, William and Mary, in Virginia. The high point of this Anglican expansion came with the so-called Great Apostasy at Yale in 1722. Yale had been established 22, 20 years earlier as an alternative to Harvard, the original Protestant college, which some New England congregationalists thought was becoming too liberal. Yale was supposed to uphold the conservative Puritan tradition, but at the commencement ceremony in 1722, all of the Yale faculty, except for one young tutor by the name of Jonathan Edwards, stood up and announced that they had converted to Anglicanism and were going to England to get ordained as Anglican ministers. When they came back, they would play important roles in spreading Anglicanism across the northern colonies, being very indicative of the trend of what was going on at that point in time. So on the eve of the Great Awakening, you had increasing tension between two different styles of religion, one the so-called religion of the head, which was more intellectual, rational, and focused on external aspects of religious observance and practice, and the other the so-called heart religion, that was more emotional and about having a more immediate connection to and relationship with God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Those favoring heart religion were more likely to belong to one of the dissenting churches, like the Congregationalists in New England, or the Presbyterians in the Middle Colonies, or the Baptists. So on top of the tension between different styles of religion, 
and the different attitudes towards religious and social authority that went with it, there was also growing tension between different churches, especially between the increasingly powerful Anglican Church and the dissenting churches, which felt very much on the defensive in these years. Another important piece of the puzzle <clears throat> is that from 1739 to 1748, so for most of the time that the Great Awakening was happening, there was also a war going on. A war between the Protestant British Empire and the Roman Catholic empires of Spain and France. Now this factor isn't usually discussed by historians of the Great Awakening, but I think it's very important. So even though the Awakening started a year or so before the war started, the broader sense of ongoing religious and military conflict between Protestants and Roman Catholicism, both within the British world and externally with the Roman, with the Roman Catholic empires of Spain and France, was in constantly fed Protestant anxieties <clears throat> about their situation and was sustained throughout the Great Awakening. This imperial conflict is also important for understanding the origins of Georgia which was established in 1733 as a special military colony on the frontier with Spanish Florida. It began as an idealistic colony that was open to migration from all sorts of European Protestants, um, including Germans. Since these colonists were supposed to be able to serve as soldiers in case there was a war against Spain, they were supposed to be independent farmers, not plantation owners. In fact, slavery was even prohibited in Georgia at first. The idea was that only free white European Christian Protestants would have the strength to defend South Carolina from the Spanish because South Carolina at that time had become the most intensive slave society in North America. It was the one British colony in North America where black people actually outnumbered white people, something that was normal in the Caribbean but abnormal in North America. Georgia was named after King George II, who was a German Protestant from the House of Hanover, whose father had become King of England in 1714 because he was the closest Protestant to the throne. This Hanoverian connection brought the British into more intensive contact with Germany and with German pietists, that is, Protestants who favored a more personal, emotional, direct evangelical style of religion, like English Puritans and others who were accused of enthusiasm. This connection gave the Great Awakening an international dimension that came together in Georgia, where a number of German pietists, especially an unusual new group, called, an unusual group called the Moravians, migrated. The Moravians were a small sect known for their intense emotional piety and also a few odd practices. They lived in strictly gender segregated communities. And if they ever faced a difficult decision, <clears throat> They would basically draw lots by writing out answers on pieces of paper, putting those paper, pieces of paper in a, in a hat, shaking the hat up and drawing out a piece of paper to see what it said. The idea behind this was that this was the one way to let God make the decision rather than corrupt human beings. The idealism surrounding Georgia's origins attracted a number of uh, interesting individuals, including the pious young Anglican John Wesley, a man who was yearning for a more intense spiritual life, so he went to Georgia as a missionary to convert Native Americans and preside over the local Anglican congregation. While he was there, he got to know the Moravians and was very impressed with their piety. They seemed to be living like the primitive Christians that Wesley wanted to emulate. Unfortunately, after a couple of years, Wesley got into trouble. He was courting a young woman, but failed to propose marriage to her. And the resulting sc scandal caused him to flee back to England. <clears throat> Worried about the state of his soul and inspired by the guidance of Moravians, he soon had a religious conversion experience and then embarked on a lifelong mission to reinvigorate the piety of the Church of England. To do so, he developed a variety of methods to enhance regular people's spiritual practice. Until the American Revolution, this so-called Methodism uh, remained part of Anglicanism, but afterwards it developed into its own separate church that became very important to the history of both Britain and uh, America. 
After Wesley left Georgia in 1738, one of his spiritual associates back in England decided to go visit the colony as well. This was George Whitfield, the man who became the central figure of the Great Awakening. Whitfield was also inspired by the example of the Moravians and decided to imitate them by building a, well, an institution of social, social welfare in Georgia, an orphanage. And <clears throat> he quickly returned back to England to raise money for the orphanage and become ordained as a minister himself. He then started preaching, but his preaching be quickly became pretty controversial for two main reasons. First of all, he criticized his fellow ministers if he did not think that they were godly enough men or had been truly converted. Second, he also began to preach outdoors. Instead of working within a parish church, as Anglican ministers were supposed to do, he preached to hundreds of people out in the fields. Moreover, Whitfield was a really good preacher. He had a powerful voice and a very theatrical style. Instead of just preaching a dry sermon, he would fill it with passion and emotion, taking on the roles of the biblical characters that he was talking about, enacting the scenes he was describing, and deliberately appealing to people's emotions. This made his preaching immensely popular. Whitfield had a real knack for writing powerful sermons, and to enhance their impact, he began to print and distribute them, so that even if people could not see him in person, they could still know what he was preaching. Whitfield returned to America in 1739 and embarked on a long series of extended preaching tours that would last for the rest of his life. At first, at least, the main purpose of these tours was to raise money for his orphanage in Georgia. But they quickly became the centerpiece of the Great Awakening. And for the next 41 years, until he died in 1770, Whitfield would cross the ocean 13 times and preach over 18,000 sermons, 78 of which he published, uh, speaking to crowds of up to 10,000 people without a microphone on numerous preaching tours of Britain and America. Because he was critical of many Anglican ministers, Anglicans in the South refused to let him preach there, even though he was still technically an Anglican minister. So he actually spent most of his time preaching north of the Mason-Dixon line. And he was most popular in New England. In fact, he died in Newburyport, Massachusetts on the day after his last sermon. <clears throat> He was probably America's first real celebrity and certainly the most famous person of the time who was not a monarch or an aristocrat. Now, even though Whitfield was an Anglican, he was much more interested in supporting evangelical religion than the Church of England itself as such. And he used his fame to support the work of revival preachers who were not Anglicans, including Jonathan Edwards. Now, since Whitfield was a Calvinist, like Edwards, they also had a lot in common theologically. This is one of the reasons why he got along so well with New Englanders and not so well with many of his fellow Anglicans, including John Wesley, who tended to be Arminian in their theology, believing that people had some role in choosing whether or not they could accept or reject salvation. Calvinists like Whitfield and Edwards believed that humans did not have that kind of power. Only God decided who would and would not be saved. And if he had decided that, you would be saved. There is nothing you could do to stop it. But it had nothing to do with your own virtue or actions. This was the message of Jonathan Edwards' most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which turned out to be the most famous sermon of the Great Awakening. The final key element for understanding the Great Awakening is the media. Newspapers were still fairly new to colonial America, but men like Benjamin Franklin were publishing newspapers in most of the major towns and cities in North America by the 1730s. These newspapers were usually filled with news, and, um, news from Europe about politics and local business affairs, but once the Great Awakening got going, people started printing stories about the religious revivals as well. Franklin became especially good at working with Whitfield to enhance the effect of his preaching tours because he would not only print Whitfield's sermons, he would also publish advertisements of his forthcoming preaching tours 
letting people know in advance where he was going to be. He would then publish dramatic accounts of what had happened the last time he preached so that people would get really excited about going to see him in person. Franklin himself was not an evangelical. He didn't participate in the Great Awakening, but he admired Whitfield, and their partnership made Franklin quite a lot of money. So altogether, this combination of Whitfield's preaching tours with the media hype <clears throat> is what made the Awakening much bigger than it otherwise would have been. This is what made the Awakening great. However, all Whitfield was doing was really connecting the dots of a series of local revivals that had been brewing over the years before he showed up. So it's hard to put an exact date on the start of the Great Awakening because of all of these revivals that had been going on beforehand. The most important and the most famous is that led by Jonathan Edwards at his congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts in 1735 and 1734, 35. Also, since Whitfield kept going until his death in 1770, aspects of the colonial revival continued for decades after the big event. Um, <clears throat> uh, but still, most historians agree that the really crucial period when most of the intense preaching was happening and most of the conversion experiences were going on took place between 1739, when Whitfield began his first American preaching tour, and 1743, when series of incidents happened that kind of put a big damper on what was going on. The most important or the most notorious was when the American-born preacher James Davenport took things a little too far in the direction of enthusiasm by getting his followers to, followers to make a bonfire of the vanities in New London, Connecticut. They publicly burned books, clothes, and other luxury items that symbolized sinfulness, decadence, and wrong religion. Things eventually reached a climax when Davenport, overtaken by the zeal of the moment, ripped off his pants and threw them into the fire. Now that was exactly the sort of thing that opponents of evangelicalism associated with enthusiasm. It seems that Davenport may have also had some mental health issues, and this is certainly how he was treated. He was forced to calm down, stop preaching, and issue an apology. And this incident, together with some other scandals, gave opponents of the revival the upper hand and the awakening stopped being as great as it had been. But also by then, most of the people who were going to be converted had already be, been converted, so you could say that the awakening had mostly done the work that it needed to do by that point in time. Now, while the Great Awakening had its strongest impact in New England, it was also very significant in the middle colonies, especially among the Dutch. The Presbyterians, a lot of them coming from Scotland and Northern Ireland, and German immigrants. The German revival was largely driven by the arrival of the Moravians who moved up to Pennsylvania from Georgia a few, uh, after a few years down south. <clears throat> and Pennsylvania had thousands of German uh, immigrants, but almost nobody who could serve as a proper minister for them. And so the Moravians took over that role even though most of these Germans were not radical pietists like the Moravians. Indeed, they found some of the Moravians' ways to be really strange, and in the end, most of them turned against the Moravians and tried to re reinvigorate their own churches on their own terms instead. In New Jersey, a Dutch minister named Theodore Frelinghausen had been preaching the pietist message with an intense and dramatic preaching style since the 1720s. In the 1730s, a local Scots-Irish Presbyterian minister named Gilbert Tennant met Frelinghausen and was inspired by him to emphasize the dangers that sinners were in and the need for a conversion experience and to adopt a more dramatic preaching style. And this was enhanced after Tennant met Whitfield on his first preaching tour. So Tennant already believed that a conversion experience was necessary, but Frelinghausen and Whitfield showed him how to develop the more effective style to get that message across. And he took that message <clears throat> to a controversial extreme in his most famous sermon, The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry. The basic point of this sermon was that you could not have a proper conversion experience unless your minister had also had a conversion experience. Since most Presbyterian ministers in the area were not new lights, like Tennant was, 
they perceived this sermon as an attack on them and their authority. The result was a major split in the Presbyterian church. The old lights who had control of the Synod of Philadelphia expelled Tennant in 1741, who then Tennant then got together with New Light Presbyterians to create a separate um, New Light Synod in New York. And this split, I mean, the Presbyterian church was one of the most significant um, uh, effects of the Great Awakening, and it would last for over 20 years. Unable to get a job in New Jersey, <clears throat> Tennant spent the next couple of years working as an itinerant minister, just like Whitfield had been, traveling up to New England on a series of preaching tours. Then in 1743, the same year that Davenport had his bonfire of the vanities in Connecticut, Tennant took up the post of minister to the Second Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, where he would spend the rest of his life. After moving to Philadelphia, he saw the Moravians and, what, and how they operated, and this made him much more conservative and cautious about questions of religious authority and possible excesses of enthusiasm. He stopped preaching like a new light, became a moderate, and began working to reconcile with the old lights, which eventually happened in 1758. Tennant's experience in many ways typifies the trajectory of the Great Awakening. It began with pious evangelical inspirations that led some ministers to challenge the authority of others, leading to divisions between supporters and opponents who did not like the enthusiasm of the revivalists. Most Anglicans in America refused to accept Whitfield, so he spent his time preaching to non-Anglicans. Most Germans rejected the Moravians, Frelinghausen was popular with some Dutch colonists, but not all. Even in his own church, there were people who criticized him and his methods. And New England became the most divided region of all. Town after town, separatist congregations split off from their local churches. Many of these separatists eventually became Baptists, and it's the Baptists who really emerged as the real winners out of the whole Great Awakening. Quakers who were surrounded by all of this activity, didn't participate directly in the Great Awakening. They developed a very different style of worship by this time, which was a silent worship that went against the sort of enthusiastic styles <clears throat> of the New Light preachers. But they also started their own reform, reform movement in these years, which began to hold Quakers to higher standards of behavior and morality, and they would expel those who failed to meet those standards. Um, among those expelled were the family of Daniel Boone. The result of this was that by the 1760s, the Quakers became, were becoming a much smaller but much more focused group that later made them very effective advocates of social causes like the abolition of slavery. Altogether, the Great Awakening posed a tremendous challenge to the religious establishments of colonial America, but it did not overthrow them. Instead, the religious divisions were channeled into new churches and new universities to train ministers for those churches. The split among Presbyterians led the New Lights to establish their own university in 1746. It started out as the College of New Jersey, but later, after it moved to the small town of Princeton, became known as Princeton University. In religiously diverse Philadelphia, people made a different choice in 1750, establishing what became the University of Pennsylvania as an interdenominational institution that wasn't supposed to cater to any particular religion, but instead was open to all, although the president at first was an Anglican. In New York, on the other hand, Anglicans got their second university when King's College was founded four years after the University of Pennsylvania. Its original name obviously signified its original religious and political loyalties, these were changed after the revolution, and it is now known as Columbia University. By the 1660s, the Baptists had become strong enough to start their own school as well in Providence, Rhode Island. What became Brown University was named after the Baptist merchant who provided much of the money to get the school going. Finally, up in New Hampshire, Eliezer Willock, a congregational minister from Connecticut, who had supported the Great Awakening, founded Dartmouth College. Its original mission was supposed to focus on converting Native Americans. That was a major goal of many of the New Light ministers. 
However, it quickly became a popular alternative to Harvard and Yale for New England elites and abandoned much of its mission to Native Americans. One final legacy of the Great Awakening was in the imperial war against Spain and France. In many ways, the, the Awakening strengthened early Americans' connection to Britain. Sermons and accounts of revivals in America were printed in Britain and vice versa. It's the kind of culmination of this is when ministers tried on both sides of the Atlantic, tried to coordinate a so-called concert of prayer, where revivalists all around the British world, from Scotland to Pennsylvania, would all pray together in a common cause. The idea was they would pick a specific date and a time to pray, and then people would, from all these different congregations in Scotland, Britain, uh, <clears throat> and across America, would pray at the same time, on the same day. Now, of course, they didn't know about time zones and time differences, so technically they didn't end up actually praying at exactly the same time. But the basic point is that there was a shared sense of belonging to a common cause that these British people had on both sides of the Atlantic. And during the war, that sense of shared Protestant identity extended to the British imperial cause. Thousands of colonists signed up to fight alongside British regulars against the Spanish in the Caribbean or against the French in Canada. In 1745, a bunch of New Englanders <clears throat> managed, with just a little bit of help from the British Navy, to capture the massive French fortress of Louisbourg in Nova Scotia. And around the same time, George Washington's older half-brother Lawrence returned home after having served under the British Admiral Edward Vernon against the Spanish in the Caribbean. That expedition had been a disastrous failure, but Lawrence was so impressed with his commander and so proud of being British that he renamed his plantation Mount Vernon. And I think there's really no better symbol of the way Americans in this area were not turning against the British, but rather identifying with them, even as they had, were divided against each other. In the end, it was this connection to Britain and British influences from the new colony of Georgia to the person of George Whitfield that really made the Great Awakening possible. And thus, I think it should not be seen <clears throat> as something quintessentially America, but rather as a British imperial event, one that revealed how very attached Americans were to Britain before the American Revolution happened.